two, but for now I'll just go to Acts chapter four, uh, verses thirty two and thirty three. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 and 33 in your Holy King James Bible. It says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. You know, this morning I want you to focus on the first part, uh, the first statement there in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. And it says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Let's pray this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're here this morning. We're opening your word and we're reading your word, knowing that it will not return void. Uh, Father, that it will accomplish that which you have purposed. We just pray, Lord, that you'll bless the service. We ask thy Holy Spirit to be here. Lord, we bow our knee before thee. And we uh, just uh, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we just ask, Lord, that you'll be in this service. Lord, that you'll bless us, Lord, to be on fire for you. Help us, Lord, not to live uh, content lives of mediocrity. But, Lord, Father, we just pray, Lord, that you'll just light us on fire. And, Lord, that we'll uh, share the gospel with our friends, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, and with all of the lost, and all of creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of the message is A Church Filled with the Holy Ghost. A Church Filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, what does a church fill with the Holy Ghost do? You know, what does a church fill with the Holy Ghost do? The question is, what does a church filled with the Holy Ghost do primarily? I know I said that several times, but I want to get that thought in your head. You know, what is it? You know, a church is a group of people called out from the world. It is a church that Jesus Christ shed his blood for. Uh, I individually, myself, am not the whole church. I am part of the church. You, if you are born again, are part of the church. No matter what denomination you are in, no matter what, what you uh, claim as far as the denomination, those who are born again by the Spirit of God are part of the whole church of God. It's a collective group of people called out of the world to be a witness for Jesus Christ in this earth. We are to go and take the gospel to every creature. Unfortunately, the wicked world and the devil has us buffaloed into silence and submission so often, doesn't he? You know, the devil comes out roaring like a lion. The devil comes out as a giant against us and intimidates us and brings us into submission of silence. You know, if the devil could do one thing to a church... If the devil could do one thing to a Christian, it would be to silence his voice. And he has different ways of doing that. But the most obvious way he does that is just by intimidating you and roaring like a lion, thinking that, wow, I don't have the opportunity to share the gospel with this person because of what? Something pops in your head. It's not the right time. It's not the right place. And all kinds of things the devil throws out there as a roaring lion, trying to get you to submit to his authority, trying to get you to submit to his power, trying to get you to submit to him so that it silences your voice church we can't be silent amen? amen we cannot be silent the church in america has been silent so long they've withdrawn to the church house and they've locked the door and they sealed the windows and they've kept everything inside a building and god never called the church to be locked inside a building i'm for church buildings I think every church should have a building that they meet in regularly to get their marching orders to go out and win the loss for Jesus Christ. But primarily, the seed of the gospel that we open up every Sunday and read is not meant to stay in the barn. Listen, a farmer that would keep his seed in the barn will never have a great harvest. Amen? Amen. This church needs to have a great harvest for Jesus. We're not called, we're not called for results. We're called to plant. The results are up to God. And God said his seed is good. And God says, take this seed that you have gotten in here out to the world and win your neighbor, win the lost. Plant those seeds and Jesus Christ himself will give the increase. Amen? Amen. The children of, we often though, the problem is we often think with our eyes. We think with our ears and we think with our feelings. You know, physically I'm talking about. We look out at the world with our, with our physical eyes 
We hear with our physical ears and we have the feelings that we have in ourselves that we look at the world how wicked it is. And the devil buffaloes is very good and tells us we can and can't do this. But we need to realize that we need to be like the children of promise, like Caleb and Joshua who did not... When the world came against them, when the spies went out in the promised land, they, you know, that Israel was promised a, a land flowing with milk and honey. They were promised a place of wonder and a place of amazement, but they never thought about what they would have to do to get into that land, that there were going to be giants and there was going to be trouble and there was going to be tribulation, there was going to be persecution. And they had so fixed themselves on ease that they didn't realize that there was work to be done before the day of rest. And the church this morning, we need to realize that there's going to be work to do before we're into the day of rest. And, 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 and most of those spies came back and they said, we went over to this land. And when we were at the land, we looked and we saw giants. And we didn't see one giant. We didn't see two giants. We saw multitudes of giants, like a forest of giants all around. And we cannot go into the land because we've seen with our eyes. We've heard with our ears. And we've experienced the feeling of knowing what it's like to be a grasshopper in their sight. But two men, Caleb and Joshua, use their spiritual eyes and say, listen, I, I saw the same thing these guys saw, but I looked through my spiritual eyes, and though they look like giants, between, before our God, they're nothing. They're stubble. God can take care of all of this if we'll just put our trust in him and understand that, listen, it is the devil's voice that keeps us from the promises of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. The devil's always trying to silence us into submission the children of Israel, because of that, had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because they saw and they heard about the giants and they saw the wicked and great power spreading himself like a green bay tree. David said in Psalm 37, 35, I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. A green bay tree is a tree that will grow up powerfully and it will grow up quickly and it will grow up strong and it will look like it just takes over more and more and more of the land until it takes up a whole forest. And David said, I've seen the wicked grow up like that. I've seen the wicked spread themselves out like there is no way to defeat them. But David was a giant killer because he looked through the spiritual eyes, seeing God bigger than his problems. Amen? Amen. We need to do the same thing. We need to be spiritually minded people. David knew a tree is tall, but an ax so small. God is greater than them all, and God can take David and his little slingshot and kill a giant. He can definitely chop down a green bay tree. Amen? Amen. There's, there's, there are things in your life that raise themselves up because of the devil as giants in your life. But we have to understand that nothing can stand before God. Nothing that opposes God can stand before him. It may look like it can stand before him for a time, but in the end, where is it? David said, I looked around and now I can't find him anywhere. The wicked. I think uh, a lot of times we forget who we serve. Amen. Amen? I think a lot of times we forget whose side we are on. Amen? If we would just for a moment, whatever situation we're in, if we would just back up for a moment into our prayer closet, you know, that's where the power's at. Back up into the Word of God and realize who is on, whose side we are on and who we're fighting for and the power that He's given us in His Word, we would no longer shriek back into the church and lock the doors, but we'd go, boldly out of the, we'd go boldly out of the doors proclaiming the gospel of God. David, when the, when the giant Goliath came at him, David did not back up. David, it says, ran at him. Can you imagine running at a giant? Because David understood, I have the power of God on my side, I have the skill of God in my hands, and I have the rock that can take down a giant. Amen? Amen? It's important that we look around and not forget who we serve. It is poor, important that we look around and not forget whose side we are on. I re, I, you know, I've read this verse in Matthew 16, 18, and I've read it, I read it so wrong for so long. Have you ever had Bible verses that you read and you read them really wrong and you didn't understand what they meant? And I've, I've understood for a long time what it does mean, but there were many times, there was a long time in my Christian life that I read over that, and when you read over something and you don't really apply your mind to learn it, and you don't allow the Holy Spirit to talk to you, a lot of times you'll read it wrong, and that's where a lot of false doctrine comes from. But I read this verse so wrong for so long that I was kind of misunderstanding what God was saying. It says in Matthew 16, 18, And, they, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, 
and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, I've never been, cons con I've never been confused about that. Peter is not the pope. Uh, there is no pope in the Christian church. Jesus is, he is the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Never was confused about that. There are people out there who are confused about this. They think that Peter was the first pope and that the Catholic church is correct. And the Catholic church is built on the doctrines of men, not on the doctrines of God. So if, if you think that Peter's the church, Jesus was speaking to Peter here. And he said, he said, he said I think he said it like this. We read text, and I don't know if you've ever got a text on your phone and misunderstood what it meant. I've gotten a few. <laughs> Somebody writes in all caps, and you're like, they're mad at me. Someone, someone says something, and you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, because we don't, we don't understand the, the, the hand motions. We don't understand the voice inflection, and we read it, and sometimes the text comes through, and we're like, what does this mean? That's why God gives a Christian the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the, the, uh, the ability of the Holy Spirit to come in and give you direction on what God actually means. You know, can, can you think about Peter standing before Jesus, and he says, you know, uh, thou art Peter. But upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus saying, he was the rock. He's the foundation. He's the head of the corner. He's the, he's the head of the headstone. He's the, he's the cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church. He wasn't saying Peter was. But that was all free there. We're going. That was not the problem I had. Here's how I read this. And upon this rock, I will build my church. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's the part I read for so long. And I was so wrong about that. In my mind, here's what, I'm, here's what I was thinking when I was younger, when I was a baby Christian. I was thinking, I used to read this verse, and in my ignorant head, I thought the gates of hell were chasing the church around. And the church would not, would, you know, the gates of hell couldn't prevail against the church, but they were chasing the church around, trying to catch the church and trying to defeat the church, and the gates of hell were, were chasing the Christian around. That's not the way it is. It's not the way it is. That's not the way it's written. That's wrong thinking. The church that the devil is chasing is losing. That's where we're at today. The devil is chasing the church, and the church has with, withdrawn itself back into its building, and it doesn't go out, and it doesn't witness, and it doesn't have any power. And it's, it's, it's a, for the most part, a lot of churches are dead because they just stay in their church, and they share the gospel with one another who already know the gospel, and their congregation dies out. There's no, no people added daily such as should be added. That's not, a, that's not a victorious church. That's not a church that this is talking about. This says, read this. It says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Where are the gates of hell? Literally right outside of hell. What is the church doing? The church is going right up to the gates of hell in offense. God did not design his church for defense. He designed his church for offense. Amen? Amen. So when it says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he's saying, the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to march all the way up to the gates of hell, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. But we have to be actively, offensively minded. Amen? And so often we're not, because the devil have us, has us buffaloed, thinking that we are being uh, defeated. Oh, the world, how wicked the world is. You know, you turn the television on, I don't recommend it. You open the paper, I don't recommend it. And you read the wicked things that are going on in the day, and the Christian, if he's not careful, can hear the roar of the lion, the devil, who's trying to devour the Christian, and he can withdraw himself and say, oh, this world is so wicked, let's just wait for Jesus to come back. That's not what God told us to do. We're supposed to watch and wait and work. Amen. As we're watching and waiting, we're working and we're prevailing against the gates of hell. March you right up to it. You know, there, there's, a, there's a man who started a ministry, and I greatly admire him. I don't know about all his doctrine. I don't know about all that. But I know he started a thing called the Church at Planned Parenthood, and he actively takes the church up to the gates of hell, and he's prevailing against them. Praise God for that man. Praise God for that pastor who actually said, you know what? The church in here is not doing the work it needs to do. Let's take it to the gates of hell. Amen? Amen? Amen. And he took it out there. You know, William... William Booth, who started the Salvation Army, he went out to the bars and started preaching outside of the bars, and people would throw things at him, and they would, they would hurl things at him, and they would curse at him, and they would mock him, and they would laugh at him, and they would hurt his, they would hurt his family if they could, and they would hurt his children if they could, but the gates of hell could not prevail against him, and the Salvation Army is still an organization that's still around today, because one man was on fire for God. Amen? Psalm 2, 1 through 3. 
This, this goes along because Psalm 2, 1 through 3 is again mentioned in Acts. Uh, and that's what we're, we're in is, is Acts. But um, it says, why do the heathen rage? Why, it asks a question. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cores from us. You know, kind of like when David said, I've seen the wicked in great power spread himself like a green bay true. They place their confidence in strength of size over wisdom. That's what they're doing. The world, if you look at the world, what are they doing? They're saying, let's join hand in hand. You know, we can be proud of our sin. We can go against God with our sin. We can raise ourselves up and there's enough of us we can overcome against the church. And we can silence the church. And we can intimidate the church into silence. That's what they're telling. That's what they're saying. You know, that's what it says here. It says, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. David, filled with the Holy Spirit, wrote these words. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In other words, they're saying, the heathen are so puffed up in their vain imagination and in the knowledge that they have that they think, wow, we got so big, the, all the kings are on our side. All the princes are on our side. All the powerful people are on our side. You look at Hollywood and how, Hollywood, how, how Hollywood it joins hand against hand and mocks Christianity. And they mock Christianity. And Christians can go pay to see the movie that's mocking them. And Satan just laughs. Because what are they doing? They're saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. We're sick of hearing about repentance. We're sick of hearing about the word of God. We're sick of hearing about Jesus who came to die for the sins of the world. We love our sin and we're going to continue in it. And the Bible asks the question, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. I want to tell you something. It's vain to fight against God. It is vain to put your faith in the strength of man. It is vain to put your faith in the strength and power of size over wisdom. A tree is a lot bigger than a match. Right? You, know, you look at a whole forest. And if that forest was a forest of enemies, you'd be like, that's intimidating. One match, and those trees are scared, right? I mean, one tree looks awful big until an axe shows up. Axe look awful small. One giant looks real big until David shows up with a little sling. He's swinging around like this. What God is waiting for is one person. One person. The whole forest comes burning down. Amen. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? You ask me, I'd say it's because they're ignorant and stupid. Those who would think, wow, we can defeat God Almighty. You ever go out in the forest? You ever go out in the wilderness and look up at the stars, the vastness of the stars, and think, wow, God created all of that? And we're going to be so vain in our imagination to think we can be proud against God, that we can shake our fist at God? There's a point in the, in the tribulation when people go through all of these things and God gives them space to repent and space to repent and space to repent and they shake their fist at God and hate him. And God says, you're done. And he laughs at them and he mocks at them and he has them in derision running from here and there because they cannot defeat God. And Christian, they cannot defeat you. Amen? Amen? Man, we should just, just, we should just relish being a child of God, knowing, listen, there's nothing that can come against us. There is nothing that can stand before us as long as we're in Christ. Every promise in the Bible is to those who are in Christ. There's not one good promise to those who are outside of Christ. Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. And, 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 you know, Psalm chapter 2 is amazing. We're going we're gonna to see how Psalm chapter 2 gets spoken of in Acts as we finish up this sermon. But Psalm chapter 2, if you read through this, it is, it is the fall of mankind. It is God's salvation plan to mankind. 
It is man rejecting God's plan. It is God say, sending his son into to the world to, to, to be a born as a baby, to be king of the earth. It goes all the way to the thousand-year reign of Christ where Christ rules with a rod of iron. All of this happens. All of this happens in Psalm chapter 2, and he says, you know what? You better kiss the son lest he be angry. You better repent before God gets angry. You better bow the knee to God before he gets angry. You better come to Christ today because you may not have tomorrow. All of this is in Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine the vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That's the world in its pride. That is the pride of life. That is the lust of the flesh. That is the wickedness of the world prevailing in this wicked world that we are in. And then it says in Psalm chapter 2, 4, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He shall, he, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. That is God taking an axe. He's taken a match to the forest that has lifted up themselves in, in disobedience against, against their creator, saying, listen, I made you. It's funny that you think I made you and you can prevail against me. Amen? Because you can't. And he says, I will laugh at them. I will vex them in my sore displeasure. Verse number six. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. That's, that's, that's what we celebrate in December. Uh, that is the birth of Jesus Christ. I don't know the exact day he was born. It doesn't matter. We celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And we worship Jesus Christ because he is worthy of worship. Because he is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, come down from heaven. He says, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. He's saying to Jesus, you ask of me, God is saying to Jesus, you ask of me, I shall give thee the inheritance for thine inheritance. I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is what the Jews were expecting the first time Jesus came. But this is what we now expect in the thousand-year reign of Christ. When all those who are beheaded for the witness of Christ will come back with Jesus, set up, set up his thousand-year reign, and he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Man, I tell you what, you, you, think, you think we have someone in office right now who loves Israel? <laughs> he does. But man, wait till the thousand-year reign. You think you got somebody in the office right now that loves Christians? Man, wait till the thousand-year reign. You think we have somebody right now that might be doing some right things? Wait till the perfect one shows up. And he does everything right. It's going to be great. Amen. The righteous rejoice when the righteous are in power. The, the righteous mourn when the wicked are in power. Man, we've done our share of mourning. But we're going to do some more mourning before the morning breaks and the king comes down. He says, thou shalt dash them. He, oh, no, thou shalt, verse number nine. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And then here, he's, he's pleading one more time with the, with, the, with the wise of this world, which is foolishness before God. He's pleading one more time with the wicked. He says, be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and he perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that push their trust in him. You know what? This morning, you're blessed. You're not blessed because you have something good in you as far as look into yourself like the New Age movement says. Look in yourself. You have all the answers. No. You are blessed because God dwells in you and you are his temple because you've been born of the Spirit. Born again. Amen? And we put our trust in him. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Like I said, you know what, can, you know what one match can do? It can burn down a forest. One match. Jesus arose from the grave. Amen? Amen? I mean, that's exciting. Jesus arose. Let me say that one more time. Jesus arose from the grave. Amen. That's a match that set this world on fire, and it will burn this earth, and it will continue to burn until all the mel elements of this world continually, I mean, just completely melt down. There'll be nothing left. And set, all you have to do is bring down a new heaven and a new earth. Don't take my word for it. It says in 2 Peter 3.12, Looking for and hasting into the coming of the day of God, 
wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That's global warming on a large scale. And it's going to be done because this wicked world refuses to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus, the light of the world, set his disciples on fire. You know, Jesus, Jesus he, he started the whole thing. He's the author and the finisher of the faith. And we read how he set his disciples on fire. And we read how he set Peter and John on fire and setting more and more people on fire. And, you know, and, and Peter, uh, he said to Peter, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Peter understood that means we need to charge the gates of hell and actually go up against Satan in spiritual warfare. Because we have been promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of God. Amen. Do you believe it? Peter and John did. You read in Acts. What was Acts? Acts was the birth of the church. Acts was the, 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 the fire starter. Jesus set himself on fire, set the church on fire, and said, go. Be ablaze. Catch the world on fire for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It's amazing how a revival can spread because of one person on fire. We've seen it ourselves. We see how one person can come in and change the whole dynamics of a church. We've seen how one person can go into a church and, and, and actually start a revival in the church. We see how one, one person can be on fire for God. And, 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 you know, listen, a lot of churches, here's what happens. There's cold, dead church just sitting there, frozen in time. Oh, they still read the Bible. They still sing some songs, but it's frozen because they're not going out. They're not doing the things the church should be doing. And they're just frozen. All of a sudden, the word of God, which will not return void, is preached. And some little kid or some little bus kid comes in or somebody comes in, some older person comes in. And the word of God is just read plainly and deadly. But the word of God is powerful and is sharper than a two-edged sword. And all of a sudden, that person gets saved. And the church starts to ostracize that person. What's wrong with this guy? What's wrong with this girl? They want to go out and talk to other people about Jesus. <laughs> they want us to go do this. They want us to go do that. What's going on? And the church starts to ostracize themselves away from this person because if they get too close to that person, they'll catch on fire. And the devil says, don't pay any attention to that person. Stay away from that person. Get away from that person because he's on fire for God. She's on fire for God. Because the devil's over there with a bucket of water trying to go, throwing water at the fire of God, trying to put it out. Amen? Amen. Happens. True story. They weren't, going to put Peter and, they weren't going to put Peter and John out. Peter and John were on fire. They were a glowing flame. I mean, the, the, the symbolism of the Holy Spirit coming down in a flame of fire was symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming down in a flame of fire. Lighting the disciples on fire to go and spread the gospel to the whole world. Jesus woke up a slumbering world. He saved you, if you're saved. Did he wake you up? Did he set you on fire? Do you have a fire in your bones that has to, has to speak to someone? Are you on fire for God? Personally, church, are we on fire for God? If not, why not? We have the power of God. I preached on that last Sunday. The power of God is the gospel. The power of God is the preaching of the cross. I preached on that last Sunday. I asked the question, do you know what the power of God is? If you had the power of God, would you use it? Are we using it? We have the power of God. The power of God is not these miracles. These miracles, yeah, the power of God came down and, and God did miracles to confirm his word with the disciples. But ultimately, he said the power of God is the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. You have that. You may never heal a person in your life. But you have the power of God, which is, which is more powerful. Healing someone for 40 years or preaching the gospel to them, they're getting saved and going to heaven for eternity. You have something more powerful than healing. You have something more powerful than all the miracles that were done in the Bible. Jesus said, these works will you do and greater works than these. Because you'll use the power of God. 
to reach the lost. In the book of Acts, we see a church on fire. And when, it's on, when, and when it is on fire, there are two distinct indications of it being on fire. How do you know if you're on fire for God? How do you know if your church is on fire for God? There's two very distinct indications of being on fire for God personally or unity with the church. Number one is action. You cannot be on fire without action. A fire that sits there and lights it, psh, we've all done that, and our fingers get burnt because we just sit there and look at it, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, ouch, and it goes out, which is the devil working in your life to keep you from being on fire for God. You started, this, this is what, maybe the second Sunday of the year? Is this the second Sunday of the year? Yes. Seems like, seems like we've already been in this year a long time. The second Sunday of the year. Some of you said, I'm going to read my Bible through from cover to cover this year, and already the second Sunday you're done. Because you went like this. And you let it burn down your fingers, and you go, oh, ouch, that, that actually hurt. That, that wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. No, no, do this. God says, read your Bible through this year. And then set it down on your Bible and start reading it so that it catches fire on you, and then it'll, it'll make you do more things for God. It'll compel you to do more for God, to, to live closer to God, to be a, a holy vessel for Jesus Christ. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, this is the second Sunday. If you've decided to read your Bible through from cover to cover, don't let the devil throw a bunch of water on that. Actually do it. Don't talk about it. Just do it. We don't have to talk about what we're going to do for God. We need to go do what we're going to do for God. The first, the first thing, if you, if you want to know if you're on fire for God or your church is on fire for God, is action. The gospel is taken to every creature. Souls are saved. Awakening begins. Revival is happening. Number two is what, what's real easy to know. Opposition. If you're on fire for God, there will be opposition. Because there is an active enemy who is powerful and he'll mock at you, he'll slander you, and he will outright bring persecution and tribulation into your life. Peter and John were on fire, and they helped light others on fire. And though the devil tried to quench their fire, they would not be quenched. They had met the risen Lord. Once you've met the risen Lord, it's over for the devil. Honestly, if you'll keep that in your mind, listen, I was lost, now I'm found. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He paid for all of my sins. All my sins are on my past. They're all gone. They're all forgiven. And Jesus rose from the grave to show me I, too, will live for eternity I need to make this time count. I need to make this time count for Christ. Peter and John were on fire for God. They went out to the temple to pray. We all know this, this, this story. The ninth hour. They went to the gate called Beautiful. As they're walking up to the gate called Beautiful, there's a man who gets carried there every day who sits there and begs alms. And the man had been carried there earlier in the day. He was sitting there begging alms. And he sees Peter and James walking up. Peter and James have no money. This man doesn't know that. He calls out to Peter and, not Peter and James, Peter and John. Peter and John. Okay, I want to get that right. Peter and John come strolling up and he sees them coming and he says, alms, give me alms, alms, sirs. And Peter looks at him and he says, look up at us. And the man looks up at them. And he says, silver and gold, Peter says these words, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and walk. And the man jumped up and started leaping and praising God because the power of God was there because the name of Jesus Christ was being glorified. It wasn't a healing service where Peter and John were being glorified. It was this healing service where the Lord Jesus Christ was being glorified. And this man jumps up and he's, he's running around praising God. And the three of them together go into the temple. Can you imagine? 40 years plus, this guy is in the temple. He's, he's begging outside of the beautiful gate, right outside the temple of God, knowing God has the power to heal him all the time. Think about this. Jesus and his disciples probably passed by this man. He probably cried out for alms. And one of the disciples, or Jesus himself, may have put some alms in his cup. And he wasn't healed. God may not heal you when you think you need to be healed. God may not do the miracle you think needs to be done right now. God has a greater purpose. This man was lame for 40 years. We think, oh, how terrible. Many of us will never be lame for our whole life, yet 5,000 souls won't be saved. This man was lame for over 40 years, and 5,000 souls were saved because one day he had faith to believe in God, and he was raised up from his lameness. And he gave all the glory to God, to Jesus of Nazareth. Can you imagine? They go strolling in the beautiful gate. Uh, they go strolling in the temple, and this man goes, I have a testimony. 
And they go, shut up. And he goes, I'm not going to shut up. I've got a testimony. You all know me. I've been here 40 years. I've been lame from my birth. And look at me. I can walk. I can leap. I can praise God. And it's all because of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. It wasn't hard to see that Peter and John were on fire. It wasn't hard to see that this man was on fire for God. Why? The gospel is being taken out. Souls are being saved. Awakening and revival is happening. And then the opposition comes and goes, I'm going to quench that. And it's, and it's not always who you expect. These were, the, you know, these were the religious guys. They come up and they go, you can't be talking in that name. You cannot be using that name in the synagogue. That name is forbidden to be spoken in here. And they laid hold of Peter and John, and they put them in a place, and they held on to them. They had counsel together. And these, you can just imagine, uh, many of these people believed because of this. Of course, they'd seen this man. They said, well, because of him, a very notable, a very notable miracle has taken place. We really can't do a whole lot to Peter and John. If we put them in prison for a long time or do something, it's only going to cause more problems. Let's go to them, and let's, let's go to them and tell them, you are forbidden to speak the name of Jesus around here. So they do that. They go and say, you cannot speak that name around here. And Peter and John said, I don't know who you are, but God told me to speak that name. I'm going to listen to God. Amen. I'm not listening to you. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care what kind of suit you're wearing. I don't care what kind of brain you think you got. I am not intimidated by you. I only bow the knee to God. And God said, go spread the gospel to every creature. Amen? And Peter and John they went back to tell their other brethren at the church. Can you imagine that church service? We don't have to imagine a whole lot because in Acts 4.23, here's what happened. They get let go and here they go. Acts 4.23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God. Okay, they didn't cry to one another about little persecution. They were actually excited about what happened. Here's a guy that's gotten healed. And we got put in jail. Praise God. That means we're doing something. That means we're actively going against the gates of hell. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord. And said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined vain things. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all, and they were all, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Amen? Amen. Why did the heathen rage? Why did the people imagine the vain thing? Why do the people think they can come against God? It's foolishness. Amen. And they fulfilled what was written back in Psalms. And they cried out to God and said, God, grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak the word of God. And then, yeah, they asked for healing, they asked for signs, and they asked for wonders. And what happened? The earth shook, and when the earth stopped shaking, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. You want to, be, you want to know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit? There's all, kinds of, there's all kinds of things that people say, well, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, here's what's going to happen. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to speak the word of God with boldness. Because it's the power of God unto salvation. Amen? Amen? That's what the church is missing today. Going against the gates of hell with the power of God. But... Peter and John weren't afraid to go against the gates of hell with the power of God. And guess what? The, 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 the gates of hell could not prevail against the church. And if you're on fire for God, it will not prevail against you. Amen? Amen? Amen. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. A church filled with the Holy Ghost... 
spake the word of God with boldness. That's the answer to the question. And if we have the power of God in our life, we'll speak the, we'll speak the gospel with boldness to those around us. That's the question. If you're not saved, you need to come get saved because you, you can't speak the word with boldness until you know it for yourself. If you are saved, a lot of us need to re-examine, are we being bold? Are we, being filled, are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Because if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to speak the word with boldness. And if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, that's why we don't. Because we're, we're allowing the devil to buffalo us into submission and silence. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here. Father, we just pray. Uh, Lord, we know that your word always exhorts us to do right. Your word always brings the word of holiness into our life. Your word always illuminates the darkness that is within our, our being, Lord, to uh, bring the light of the gospel in, to uh, dispel the darkness, and, Lord, to bring us into right fellowship with thee. Help us, Lord, to submit to uh, crucifying this flesh. It is this flesh, it is our selfishness that keeps us from being victorious Christians, that keeps our church from being a victorious church, that keeps uh, our country, our city, our families from revival. If we would just submit to your will, to your authority, and to speaking the word of God with boldness, Father, we could see great miracles. Of course, we'd see great persecution. But Father, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. Pray, Lord, your blessing upon each of the one of, ones of us who have heard this message, that we will use it uh, and glorify you, that everything that would be done would be for the glory of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ask for a song of invitation this morning.